Open your Bibles, please, to the letter of Jude, to Jude's epistle. We are going to continue in verses 3 through 7 in our meditation of Jude writing a letter that went from the topic of salvation to the topic of contending or contention. We'll be reading verses 3 through 7. Thus says God's holy and infallible word, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were destined to the, for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, like, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Let us go to the Lord in prayer once again. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the goodness of it. We thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning and to meditate on the goodness of the truth and veracity of your word. Father, as we have prayed and continue to pray, we ask, Father, that you give us eyes that see your word clearly and truly. That you give us ears that hear your word, Heavenly Father. We ask that by your spirit we have a mind and a heart that is willing and able to retain and engrave your word upon it that we might not sin against you, Father. And we ask that your Holy Spirit liven us in such a way that we be not only hearers of your word, but also doers of your word. We ask this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. We covered last week the interesting reality that this is a loving letter. That Jude, like the Apostle John, is an author who loves those who he's writing to. Spoke about the fact that he says several times the word beloved. Those who he said are beloved in God the Father and kept for Christ. And how it is that this idea, this reality that we see within Jude is absolutely upside down in this world. This idea that you can write in love and write in love exhorting and in love chastised and in love appeal to someone to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We also talked about and covered the fact that the way that Jude writes this sets a fire under people. Because he talks about the reality that at first he was going to write the letter that never was. Jude's epistle of salvation never happened. The letter that was going to write about the common salvation and how that was going to be either never happened as we know it 
or it happened and we simply don't have it available for us to see. But what he wrote here is that this is what I had in mind. I was going to write about our common salvation, but I could not escape. And I found it absolutely necessary. You could say, I fell under the absolute conviction to write appealing, or as the LSB says, exhorting you to contend for the faith. And we talked about the fact that by saying, I found it necessary to appeal to you, to write appealing to you, it was supposed to be a alarm bells kind of situation for those that were going to read this epistle. Hey, what is coming is actually important. Actually, it's so important that the original intended letter didn't happen. This is actually so important, so needed, so necessary that it overrode the originally intended letter. That means that we should be all the more attentive to this. And I think not only was this a needed set of alarm bells for those people that received this in Jude's time, but all the more for Christians in modernity. Those Christians who get to Jude and it's just one page before you get to Revelation and all of that wonderful mystical beasts and scorpion things coming out of holes and things that might be UFOs, depending on how you want to interpret it. Well, compared to that interesting book, what is this one-page thing right before it? It's a letter of grave importance. A letter of such importance, a letter of such necessity, that it was stressed and authored by the Holy Spirit in such a way that the words are structured this way. And Jude doesn't waste time or space rehashing everything pertaining to the condemnation he's going to talk about in verse 4 and onward about the false teachers. But he does talk about that reality. He is intending for God's people to be equipped to contend for the faith. As such, as we talked about last week, he prays first and foremost for mercy and peace and love to be multiplied. And we talked about the fact that mercy is only asked to be multiplied in letters that specifically address false teachers. So we already have one alarm bell after another, after another, saying, hey, what's about to be unfolded is actually pretty important. And we got to read through verse 3. Beloved, I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation. I found it necessary to write appealing to you, to contend, to fight, to make an exerted effort for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, and we are now getting into why. And that is what we saw in verse 4. We started to touch on it last week, and we're continuing this week. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And we closed last week with a comment from Martin Luther that said, For this cause will I remind you that ye should abide in the faith which ye have heard, because there is even now a wavering, and already there have come preachers who set up other doctrines beside the faith, by which people are led away gently and unsuspectingly from the true way. This we know well, we now well understand, since we know that no one is righteous and justified by works of his own, but only through faith in Christ, insomuch that he must rely on the work of Christ as his chief good. Then, 
where there is faith, whatever is done as works is all done for the good of our neighbor. And thus we guard ourselves against all works which are not performed with the intent that they shall be of service to our neighbor, as is now the estate of priests and monks. Therefore, wherever anyone now secretly introduces anything else than this doctrine of faith in regard to such orders and works, he leads the people astray, so that they shall be condemned along with him. And we talked about the fact that here we are in the 1500s, Martin Luther writing about the fact that here are people in my day, says Martin Luther, who are doing exactly this. Exactly what Jude is writing about. Setting up false doctrines. Setting up false doctrines and gently, unsuspectingly, sneaking people out of the true way. And he warns, be on guard. Understand there is no other work than the work that is already established in Christ. We see false doctrines propagated in Jude's day. We saw Peter warning about it. Those that already were and those that would come after. Christ warned of that reality when he said there would come sheep that are actually wolves disguised in sheep's clothing. And now, in our modern day, we see false doctrines propagated all over the place with everything ranging from the health and wealth, prosperity gospel, to the easy believism that gives a platform for perverse ideologies to grow within the church. There's a need to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints because there are certain people who have crept in. They have crept in already. And they are unnoticed. They are apostates. They are hypocrites. They are tares planted among the holy wheat of Christ Jesus our Lord. The truth of the matter is that assaults on the truth and veracity of God's word come most often and most destructively from those that claim to be, quote unquote, of the faith. I'm a believer. This is my Jesus. And this is the very reason why discernment is so important. It's the reason why the scriptures admonish you not to have an unguarded and ungirded mind. It's also the reason why Paul told the Galatians that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's the reason why the author of the Hebrews warned all Christians, not just pastors, all Christians to make sure that no root of bitterness grows up among believers. Again, this is a charge that belongs to all Christians, not just to the elders. Every single believer has the charge, do not let any root of bitterness grow up among you. Every Christian has a charge. Beware, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You are supposed to be active, in this regard, it is absolutely insane to really think, well, everyone in here, in a larger congregation, right? Everyone in here is Christian. We've got 500 people, and absolutely every single one of them is going to heaven. By what standard do you actually believe that? Do you know all 500 of those people in such a way that you can make that declaration? Paul himself was sorrowful but realistic about the fact that even among those who he himself taught, as elders, those that he educated and reared up, 
and admonished that from among them there would be those that would rise up as wolves in sheep's clothing. In Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30, he says, pay careful attention. Again, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church which he obtained with his own blood. I know, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. The scriptures are not whispering about the serious danger posed by false Christians and false teachers and their false doctrines. It's a truth that the apostles were not ignorant of. If an apostle says, hey, look, I taught y'all, and I know from among you, from among yourselves, there's going to be men that are going to rise, and they're going to speak twisted things. I taught you truth. I taught you gospel. I gave you what the word of God is. What Peter says is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you that will rise up, will twist it and will draw away the disciples. Likewise, the scriptures admonish clearly that every believer, not just the elders, have a charge from God to be on guard, to be battle ready, and to not allow such people to abide and pollute and leaven and poison the true believers. The danger is real. These false believers creep in among the faithful and undermine the true faith. They mislead newborn Christians. They lead them, as Peter has spoken of already, into sexual immorality by distorting the truth. Or as Paul said, by twisting the truth, by twisting the faithfulness of God's commandments into sensuality and carnality. They undermine the archy and the structure that God has implemented within the church. They undermine the worship and the faithfulness to God's commandments from within through their crafty and deceitful ways. Claiming to be believers, they bastardize the truth. And just as the scriptures say, they are roots of bitterness. They're the people that sit back, oh man, can you believe it? Here we go again, another legalistic sermon from the pastor. Is it legalism or is it the preaching of the word of God? There's a standard by which you can measure, and the Bereans knew that. And yet these roots of bitterness bring discord and dissension among brothers. They smear the holy name of Christ through their perversion and their carnality in the public square, and they lead those who don't know better and who don't have their minds guarded up, girded up, and aren't battle-ready astray with them into bastardizing and into blaspheming Christ before the world as they follow carnalities and perversions rather than the commands of Christ. You've got freedom in Christ, man. You've got new morning mercies. You've got new morning mercies guaranteed. So it doesn't matter what you do. It's okay. So you sinned. So you do this. So you do that. It's all right. God guarantees you new morning mercies. God guarantees... Perpetual forgiveness, no matter what. And this is the reason why the scriptures say we have to encourage one another to love and to good works. Why we are to care enough to lovingly admonish one another, as we see in the scriptures. It's the reason why God's people must be a people of the book. A people whose authority is Scripture alone. So that when the world 
and the false rail against you, saying that you are the most unloving, the most hateful, the, clo the most closed-minded individual they have ever encountered, you can stand firm in the reality that love and faithfulness have already been defined for you by Christ. And they have pre been preserved for you. These definitions have been preserved for you by the prophets and the apostles in the word of God alone. Their feelings matter little in the equation at that point. Fidelity to Christ the King, Christ the Master, is what needs to reign supreme in your heart and in your mind. Not the passing fads and whims of demonic wisdom and definitions of the world. The most loving thing that you can do for a brother or sister in Christ who is drifting away into false doctrines is to admonish them, is to exhort them in love for their eternal soul. It's following right along the lines of what Paul did. It's following right along the lines of what Peter did when he dedicated an entire chapter highlighting the hell of fire and the torture, the likes of Tartarus, that awaits those who are going astray into false doctrine. The most loving thing that we can do is to be faithful to the word and admonishing one another, exhorting one another as we are called in the word. The most loving thing that we can do to those who are under the thrall of false doctrine is to charge them to repent. Showing them from the scriptures what the truth is, why what they believe is a deviation from the faith once delivered to the saints. That obviously means that you have to be immersed enough in the scriptures that you can go to these people and say, you know what, hey, this is where you are wrong. Not according to what I have to say, because what I have to say and what I think doesn't matter. According to the infallible word of God, you are erring. This is the standard. This is the rule of faith by which both your knees and mine bow. And this is only possible if you're keeping yourself alert and battle ready and immersing yourself and washing yourself and renewing yourself and checking yourself, first and foremost, through the infallible and inerrant word of God. By abiding in his word daily, by making it your genuine delight and the one thing you consume the most on a daily basis knowing that it alone is the source given to us for light and truth. Your word, thy word, is a light and a lamp unto my path. Nothing else illumines our way like the word of God. I cannot stress this enough, especially in our emotionalistic and individualistic-centered time. We must immerse ourselves in the word of God because there has been and continue to be sneaky and crafty deceivers creeping in whose sole intention is destruction and corruption. Jude says that these are people who are designated for this condemnation. The very same condemnation that Peter said starting in 2 Peter 2, 3, and going through the whole chapter, the condemnation of which Peter said, their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. This condemnation is a predestined condemnation, a preordained condemnation that is guaranteed to fall upon the heads of those who pervert the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and lead astray the weak and the ungirded. John Calvin comments saying he calls that judgment or condemnation or a reprobate mind by which they were led astray to pervert the doctrine of godliness. For no one can do such a thing except to his own ruin. 
but the metaphor is taken from this circumstance because the eternal counsel of God by which the faithful are ordained unto salvation is called a book. And when the faithful heard that these were given up to eternal death, it behooved them to take heed lest they should involve themselves in the same destruction. It was at the same time the object of Jude to obviate danger, lest the novelty of the thing should disturb and distress any of them. For if these were already long ago ordained, it follows that the church is not tried or exercised, but according to the infallible counsel of God. There's a reason why Jude reiterates the words of Peter regarding false teachers. And that is so that God's people will be emboldened in their contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. If you understand, these people are Condemned. It is significantly easier to be bold in the Lord when you have that reality in mind that God has already decreed the end of these people from long ago, from before the foundation of the world. It makes it easier to kick them out of the church as the scriptures command. It makes not eating with such a one as the scriptures command. that one should do with an apostate easier. It makes calling them out on their false doctrines that much easier when you bear in mind that God has already condemned them. And this in and of itself is so contrary to what modern evangelicals believe because they are so wrapped up in emotions and their minds are so distorted by the idol of American individualism that they cannot see this. They would rather appeal to that mythic 11th commandment of thou shalt be nice than say anything of the things that we just talked about. They would call all of those actions unloving and unchristian. Not based off of scripture, but based off of their feelings and their interpretation of what they believe their relationship with God is. And we must ask ourselves the question, by what standard do we judge what is loving and Christian? And the answer is God's word. And according to his word, we are to contend to the, for the faith, once delivered to the saints, with boldness, rooting out the leaven, and de-weeding all roots of bitterness within the house of God in full confidence that the eternal state of every single human being is decreed by God and that in this situation, acting in submission and in obedience to His Word, we trust that those being excommunicated, those that are being cut off from any sort of relationship with the body, are those that God has condemned already. This is where the feelings must be brought into submission by the authority of the word of God. We can choose to be nice or we can choose to obey. And the word of God clearly states to obey is better. If the word of God says that the sacrifice, the worship of the wicked is an abomination before him, how much more horrible is it when those that know better are participants in that abomination. When you know better, but because you want to be the nice guy, you don't say anything. You don't speak up. 
This is what God's word heralds. Now, these false teachers refuse to heed the warnings of the prophets in the Old Testament. They refuse to heed the warnings in the New Testament regarding the fires of hell and the wrath that would consume them for eternity. And instead, as Jude says, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. They choose to pervert, to twist, to distort, to bastardize the grace of God. The same grace that we sing in our hymns. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. And they take that and they bastardize. Hey, it's, it's greater than all our sins. Doesn't matter how many sins we got. Doesn't matter how many we pile up. It's like they ignore anything that Paul might have said about, hey, we should sin more. It's like Paul never addressed that reality. And moreover, they are in the truest and most objective sense ungodly. We cannot skip by that word. They are categorically ungodly. They are deniers of our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Again, we, we should think about the purpose and the intent of this letter. And if Jude intends to encourage believers to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, if that's what he intends when he writes this, and how he writes this, it will lean towards aiding Believers in that goal. So as we considered earlier that Jude mentions the condemned state of those who would stand on the receiving end of Christian contention, we now see the same people who are already revealed to us as deceivers and condemned are also revealed to be ungodly deniers of the only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. They are perverters of the redeeming and forgiving grace available to believers. They see the forgiveness available and they are the ones callous and desensitized to such a degree that they see that grace as a perpetual permission to revel in their carnalities. Jude highlights all this so he can say, look, these are the people who you are to contend with. This is who they are, not in a subjective sense, not in an emotional sense. This is who they are in the truest sense. They are condemned before God. They are ungodly. They are perverters of grace. They are deniers of our only Master and our only Lord, and you, Christian, with these realities in mind, should find it that much easier, if you are a true and faithful Christian, to stand up for Jesus and to contend for the faith and the truth against such people. Because they've been defined for you as categorically condemned. They've been defined for you as perverters of grace. They have been defined for you as deniers of the sovereignty, the mastership, and the dominion, the lordship of Christ. And they deny this every minute of their lives. He arms and equips in love Christians to be able to contend for the faith. He says, I don't want you to go into this not knowing who you are fighting. And this is, again, another example of why the Word of God absolutely covers everything. Because the Lord knows how we can be. Well, this is my cousin you're talking about, Lord. This is my brother you're talking about, Lord. This is my father you're talking about, Lord. This is my mother. This is 
a relative. This is my neighbor you're talking about, who I grew up with and who I love so very much. Well, the word of God, infallible, inerrant, supreme standard, has declared that if they are these people, and you have scrutinized them according to the word of God, then categorically they are those that are already condemned. And if you see what Peter has said, they have been condemned, predestined as condemned before the foundation of the world. They are perverters of grace. They are deniers of the sovereignty and dominion of the Lord and Master Jesus Christ. And you have a duty as a true servant, as a true slave, as a true doulos of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is to contend against them. But Peter, or not Peter, but Jude doesn't stop just there, but he proceeds to walk through and give us a biblical panorama that's intended to further strengthen the Christian resolve in standing firm and contending for the faith. He says in verse 5, Now, now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. If we're talking about non-believers, and you have your inclinations, so let's go to the scriptures, let's view this panoramically, and let's see what this looks like, what non-believers look like within the body of believers, and let's see what the response is. And the first example that Jude gives is the unbelievers in the wilderness, those who saw incredible miracles, the likes of which no one certainly in our generation has ever seen. None of us have walked with a sea split on either side of us. None of us have eaten manna come down from heaven, unless, of course, we understand that we eat the manna from heaven every Lord's Supper. But we don't have shoes and boots that don't wear out. That'd be great, wouldn't it? We'd never have to shop again. But we don't have shoes, shoes and boots and clothes that don't wear out for many, many years. We don't have a pillar of fire leading us at night. The Shekinah glory of God leading us by day and protecting us from the scorching heat of this last week. And man, was it hot last week. I saw a cloud that looked like it might bring some rain. And I never related more to what I preached in Second Peter than I did in that moment. Yes, give me some rain, just a drop. Just some drops right now. It's 110 degrees, it's hot, and it's humid as all get out. Give me a little bit, just some sprinkles. And it came, and it went, and it gave me nothing, and I understood all the more what false teachers were. Those false wells, those dry wells, those empty clouds that say, I'm going to rain, but don't bring anything. They see all of these miracles, and yet when it came time to enter the promised land, they didn't believe. They did not believe. And then instead they believed the report of men who feared, rather than the, the report of Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb, who did believe in the Lord. And so we see in Numbers 13 and 14, Numbers 13, verses 30 to 33, Numbers 13, verses 30 to 33, and Numbers, four, uh, Numbers 14, verses 1 through 4, the following. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we are. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report of the land, that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw are of great height. 
And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. All of those miracles they had received and seen, God Himself spoke to them. And they couldn't withstand hearing His voice. They feared and trembled. They grumbled and complained. And when they get all the way there, they say, it would have been better if we died back in Egypt. Matter of fact, it would have been better if we died in the wilderness. We're done. Let's pick a new leader and let's go back to Egypt. Even though the Lord had said, I have brought you out of the land of slavery by my mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So what is the response of the Lord? The Lord responds in two parts. One part before Moses intercedes on behalf of the people and the latter part after he intercedes. And yet both of these reveal truths that Jude is pointing to in this example that are helpful for Christians contending for the faith against false believers. So the first response is in Numbers 14 verses 11 and 12. Numbers 14 verses 11 and 12. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them, I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Now know that the Lord reveals their hearts. And he says that they have seen all these signs. They've seen everything that he's done among them. From the splitting of the sea to the pillar of fire. All of these miracles. And yet at the end of the day, they despise God. And they do not believe in him. In spite of all of these signs done among them. And, and this is revealing, as it always is, to Christians. Because those pseudo-Christians, those false believers, are the same. No matter how much they partake, no matter how much they participate in the goodness that God gives to His people, they grumble. They complain. And in their hearts, they despise the God that they claim to serve. See, we often talk about this when it comes to non-believers. We say, you know what? Worldly people won't believe. It doesn't matter how many miracles they see. They always say, oh, well, you know what? If God just did a miracle for me, then I'd believe. And it's very easy for Christians to say and use sections like this and say, well, they wouldn't believe even if there were signs. But we have to understand that the context of this is people that are supposed to be the people of God. Tears among the wheat. False people of God within the people of God who though they see and participate, do not believe. And the same scenario plays out. The Lord could do astounding miracles 
The Lord can answer prayers. The Lord could heal the cancer of innumerable people within that congregation, grow that congregation wonderfully, do a wonderful work within that congregation over the course of generations. And yet, in all of that time, these people would remain the same with a heart that despises him and does not believe in him and with perpetual grumbling against those that are actually faithful to him. So Christians looking at this and seeing that example are supposed to think, look, this is the same situation as those people in the wilderness. Just because they're here and they've been here longer than I've been a member at this church doesn't mean anything. If they're false teachers, if they're false believers, if they're false Christians, they're just like these people. That God says, how long will they despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? How long will these false Christians despise me? How long will they not believe in me even when they see true Christians blessed by me? Even when there are faithful ministers preaching my word. And so we go to the second part of God's response in Numbers 14, verses 20 to 25. Numbers 14, verses 20 to 25. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly... As I live and as the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despised me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. So God basically responds saying, you know what? You say it's better if you die in the wilderness? Go and die. You will go and you will die in the wilderness. Not a single one of you will come in. You dare say, oh, it would have been better if we died in the wilderness. Guess what? You're getting exactly what you asked for. You will go and you will die. You rebelled and you complained. And you did not obey. You rebelled ten times. They did not obey. And they're condemned to death in the wilderness for their rebellion and for their hatred and disobedience. The psalmist uses this example in Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. Psalm 95, 7 through 11. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof. Though they had seen my work for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. And these are the exact same words that are echoed by the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11. Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11, where he says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing 
in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Jude points us to this so that we can see that those that are condemned have always been the same. They are the same in character, and God has something very particular to say about them. They are rebellious in heart. They are those that God loathes, detests, abhors, and they are those who will not enter His rest. Not only were they prevented, as those in the wilderness, from entering God's earthly promised land, the land of Canaan, but they, as is revealed later on, would not enter God's eternal rest, God's eternal promised land. This is the very example that is used to exhort and encourage Christians not to harden their hearts like the hard hearts of the grumbling God-haters in the wilderness because it carries eternal consequences. And it is the exact example that is used so that Christians can understand when Jude says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them, he's simply continuing by way of reminder to drive the point home. These false believers look like this. This is what they look like as seen through the Old Testament. This is panoramically what they look like. This is categorically what they are. This is what God has said about them. This is how much God detests them. This is how much they hate God. This is what their attitude is toward God. And this is what God has to say as pertains to whether they will enter their eternal rest. So don't ask yourself, well, you know what? They might repent. If, we, if only we can just let them stay at church a little bit longer, they might repent. Your job is not to let them stay within the body longer. Your job is to follow Matthew 18. And if they do not repent, excommunicate. And then do not even eat with such a one. The Lord abhors their rebellion and he considers their disobedience and their rebellion with a particular hatred and condemnation. They will not enter his rest, unlike the faithful servants. Those faithful servants of whom Matthew wrote in Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your masterful master. Only the obedient, only the faithful enter into the rest and joy of their master. What greater joy do we have than entering into the presence of our Lord eternally? This is fuel for faithfulness. This is fuel for contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. And of course, Jude continues with two other panoramic examples in verses 6 and 7 which is what we'll get to next week. We close with the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.